Hello, everyone, and welcome to Data Byte 153, Essentially Unprotected Health Data and Surveillance of Essential Workers During COVID-19. I'm Amanda Lenhart, Program Director for Health and Data at Data and Society. I'll be your host for today with Data and Society researcher Livia Garofalo, alongside the events team, Tonika Onikakami and Rigo Lara Guzman. We would first like to thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for their support of this research. For those joining us for the first time, Data and Society is an independent nonprofit research organization. We believe that empirical evidence should directly inform the development and governance of new technology. We study the social implications of data and automation, producing original research to ground informed, evidence-based public debate about emerging technologies. Data and Society began in New York City, an island node in a large network of hills, rivers, and mountains <clears throat> in the Atlantic Northeast, known as Lenapehoke, homeland of the Lenape diaspora, and a historical gathering place for many Native peoples. Since the pandemic, we left our Manhattan office and have been connecting online by a different network, a vast array of servers, cables, and computer devices. In the United States, much of this infrastructure sits on stolen land, acquired under the extractive logic of white settler expansion. As an organization, we acknowledge this history and uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data, and territory around the planet. I'm excited to introduce my colleague and co-author on this report, one of many, uh, Livia Garofalo, a cultural and medical anthropologist and researcher on the health and data team at Data and Society. And she will introduce today's interpreters and panelists. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yes, today we are joined by Claudia Alvarez, who is a translator, interpreter, and localization specialist based in Lima, Peru, as well as Valeria Lara, an interpreter living in Mexico City. Um, to access the Spanish to English interpretation, you can click on the globe on your computer or the three dots if you're using a phone, and then select Spanish. Uh, and this will enable you to hear the simultaneous interpretation. So gracias, Claudia and Valeria. Uh, but it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, our panelists for today, uh, who are Angela Stisi and Irene Tang. Angela Stisi is Associate Professor of Anthropology uh, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And Irene Tang is a Senior Researcher and Policy Analyst at the National Employment Law Project. So welcome, and thank you again for being with us today to discuss uh, this report. Uh, we'll start with a short presentation from Amanda to frame this discussion. So back, back to you, Amanda. Thank you. All right, hopefully everyone can see the uh, screens here, see the, the, okay. So we really wanted to ground this conversation today in the research that Livia and Ereti and Joan and I have been doing for the last almost two years. And as a part of this project, we wanted to understand what workers, particularly essential workers experiences were with health-related surveillance at work during the pandemic and its impact on their lives. We wanted to understand what tools were being used to capture this data and how it was being used. So how do we do that? Hold on a second. Sorry. There we go, sorry. So we did this by interviewing 50 workers in grocery stores, meatpacking and food processing, manufacturing plants and warehouses between October 2021 and March of 2022. We also did nine interviews with additional experts in occupational safety, public health, employment law, and worker organizations. We conducted these interviews in English and Spanish over Zoom, and all uh, participants were offered complete anonymity, and the participants were compensated for their time. So one thing we actually need to talk about before we get into the meat of the findings is that the workers in this study came into the pandemic with an already baseline of precarity. So many of these workers worked in high risk occupations, particularly the meat packers and the folks working in warehouses. Many of them were worked in low wage occupations and almost all of these workers, many of them had very few supportive policies. Um, in some cases, there was no paid leave of any kind, often no paid sick leave. Um, and many of these workers also had um, punitive point systems for any type of work they might have missed. 
and many of them also had no access to health insurance. So, so already uh, with a baseline level of precarity there, many of these workers were also predominantly workers of color who dif faced disproportionate risks um, in their work, um, in their lives through racism, but also through racism and challenges within the medical system that meant that workers of color and their outcomes around COVID-19 were um, predominantly more negative than white Americans. Similarly, public health guidance was also uh, super challenging during this time. Um, public health guidance and the intersection between that and the changing political winds, regional differences in infection, guidance from employers, all of those were constantly changing, both across the study time period, but also across the pandemic. And workers were caught in the middle trying to manage these constantly shifting and changing uh, understandings of the disease and approaches to it and sort of political approaches to it and trying to navigate all of that. And so all of these things together created this condition of real stress and difficulty for these workers. So the one thing that came out loud and clear in our study is that these essential workers wanted to know very critical pieces of information when they walked into work. They wanted to know who is sick, is there COVID in the workplace, but specifically who is sick. How close have they come to me and for how long? And will I infect my family? And so employers were doing some things that we'll get to in a second that there were, there's responsibilities that employers have, but they were doing some, taking some steps to try to collect health data about workers as a part of a plan of trying to keep the workplace safe. Some of this happened at the entrance and that's particularly temperature scans and these uh, symptom and exposure surveys. Um, some of this happened inside the workplace. This is cameras and human monitors. There was also a, an enormous number of other types of sort of spatial and temporal shifts, both in scheduling and in sort of locations and space in the workplace that also affected workers. But one thing that's also important to note is a lot of workers were kind of skeptical of these changes, referred to in some cases um, as hygiene theater or from our study as COVID theater. Workers thought this was a performance. They questioned how effective these measures were in actually keeping them safe, felt like it was the employers just trying to demonstrate some sort of sense of care, not, not caring whether it was effective. And at the end of the day, some of these actions, particularly those at the entrance of the workplace, often put workers in closer proximity to each other than they thought was safe and potentially increased their risk. So that was another sort of interesting uh, challenge with this sort of data collection in the workplace. And employers also had a really important needle that they were trying to thread here. So the, the Occupational Safety and Health Act requires employers to provide a workspace that is free from recognized hazards that might cause harm or death. Um, but on the other hand, the Americans with Disabilities Act covers health information in the workplace and requires that these employers keep this information strictly private, particularly information that's about the body, right, that would be a part of what might be called a medical exam. Other types of information that might pertain to health, so relation, information about ventilation or about movements in the workplace, not necessarily covered under this, but information about COVID-19 status in particular, your body temperature, all of this had to be held strictly private. So employers were trying to walk a line here, but they actually, what did they do? So they did collect some data as we heard earlier through these temperature checks and all of these different methods, but they were somewhat haphazard about it. There wasn't a lot of data retention. It was uneven. Sometimes it was just on a piece of paper. Um, it wasn't particularly consistent. Um, and then the thing that's actually most important though is that they didn't share this information back with workers. What information they shared was very vague um, and unspecific that COVID existed in the workplace, but not with enough informational specificity to workers to help them understand and calibrate their own risk. So this is actually a quote from one of the workers in our study upon him learning that his supervisor has COVID and that his other supervisor lied to him about it. He said, no contact tracing, none. I was livid. I couldn't believe that out of, out of every little thing, they wouldn't just give me the kindest thing of just saying, go get tested. Not even saying who got it, just saying, go get tested. It's for your own health. Nothing. Just wear your mask, which nobody did. And that was that. So another thing we need to know here is that Amazon was a particularly well-represented employer in the study and that they are different. We have a part of the report called the Amazon exception. And really what's important is that Amazon already has a pre-existing system for collecting an enormous amount of data about their workers. And they just added onto it through the pandemic. Um, the intensity and expansiveness of Amazon's data capture was unparalleled in our study. They really were a true outlier. But one thing that actually they were 
that actually was quite consistent in which Amazon is just the most extreme version is that for almost all the employers in our study, data is collected for the benefit of the employer and not for the benefit of the worker. And Amazon, again, just takes that to, a, to the extreme. So what did workers do? Well, they were afraid. We hear this all throughout the interviews. This was a, a, a scary and frustrating, angering time for workers. But workers are also resilient and they took this opportunity to build on the relationships they had with other workers to build bridges across these informational voids. So they built on these histories of mutual aid, working together, you might call it folk contact tracing, you might call it um, sort of rumors, um, you might call it just um, kind of coordinating across, but workers work together to try to understand and better understand the risk in the workplace. Sometimes workers even coordinated to create new policies that would affect a particular subpart of a work site. Um, for instance, workers in our study who created a mask mandate to enter their part of the work site, which ultimately their employer supported, even though the employer was unwilling to place a mask mandate over the whole uh, workspace. It's also important to remember that unions and worker organizations also served a really important role here. In the workplaces where they were present, they served this important intermediate mediating role between workers and employers, holding employers accountable for the safety that both the CDC and public health recommended, but that they promised to do, but also keeping workers accountable and, and making sure that workers are reporting their own um, health status. It's important to note here too, that for workplaces with high turnover or lots of temporary employees, where workers don't have such great relationships with each other, this was a lot harder to enact. So the end of our study, we asked workers what would make them feel more protected. We asked experts this too. And the first three bullets on this, on this slide really encapsulate what workers wanted, but critically workers wanted respect. They wanted respect for their dignity as humans and they wanted that manifest through basic safety net policies. They wanted paid sick leave, they wanted paid time off, they wanted a $15 federal minimum wage, they wanted affordable functional health insurance. They also wanted the respect of clarity about infection in the workplace. They wanted to understand this and that could be through trustworthy contract tracing. We have very few examples in our study of this, but a couple which use a technology to, to do contact tracing and with data minimization policies in place, workers accepted and appreciated this type of tra contact tracing. Other things that were suggested to us through some of the experts and other workers that we talked to were worker health committees. So there are some pilot projects in Los Angeles and New York where workers come together to do peer education, but also to work with employers and with public health to help improve the work, the safety of workers in the work site. Also revising ADA guidance to help um, better balance privacy with safety, um, particularly with airborne or uh, airborne materials. And finally, increasing funding for OSHA. OSHA being the main lever we have in this country to help keep workplaces safe and healthy. Um, OSHA has been chronically underfunded in a bipartisan manner. And so more funding for OSHA would help it actually do the enforcement of the rules we have on the books. And I wanna leave with this quote from one of our workers. I just think that the company could do better if they wanted to, rather than just looking at us as just numbers, try and see us as human beings, as people that have been risking their lives every single day for them. And as I said, this is based on a report that is going to be fully released on March 1, and we want to talk about it with you all today. There's a link below that you can access it if you haven't already had a chance to take a look. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Livia, Irene, and Angela to take this conversation and expand on it. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Amanda, for that. Uh, and you can find all the information in the chat. Uh, but thanks so much to our guests for being here, Angela and Irene, uh, who have done extensive work on uh, on labor. And so I wanted to start with Angela. Uh, I want to start with you. So in our research, we talked to a lot of meatpacking workers across the United States. And I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about your own work um, that you've done in poultry processing and sort of what are the, the structural conditions of precarity um, in that kind of low wage work um, that was present even before COVID and that then sort of led to some of these huge outbreaks in these giant meatpacking plants. Sure, Olivia, I'd be happy to. And, and I'm just really excited to see this essentially unprotected report come out. And um, I think it's it resonates with a lot of um, my research expertise and also takes it in directions that are exciting. And I was really happy to, to see the advanced copy and, and get to learn from you all. Um, like you mentioned, my research has been largely in the poultry industry, but poultry shares um, 
a lot of the same basic contours as meatpacking, right? Rural, physically grueling, low wage, low union density, heavy, heavily reliant on black and brown workers, on refugee and immigrant workers, many of whom are undocumented. Um, and having written a book on this industry called Scratching Out a Living, sort of in the COVID moment, I was able to bring you know, this expertise to bear and weigh in on the, on the, the structure of these two industries as it relates to labor, um, which together, as you noted, became early hotspots of COVID illness and death. Um, and I appreciate sort of the question of what happens pre-COVID because this industry is so long relied on the surveillance of workers to, to stretch their labor capacity, right? To decrease labor costs and increase profit. Um, so some of my work has sort of looked at what was happening in the 1970s and 80s and even 90s when African-American workers um, were organizing U.S. born workers, largely black workers, organizing for better wages and working conditions and gaining some traction. And rather than meeting those their basic demands, the industry fought back. And where I've conducted my research in, um, in rural Mississippi, this took shape um, in retaliation and violence and eventually in this like very strategic calculated campaign to recruit and transport thousands of immigrant workers to the area, um, basically flooding the labor market, right? With, um, and essentially rendering all workers disposable. disposable. Um, for six years, I collaborated with the Mississippi Poultry Workers Center and I coordinated their workplace injury project um, where workers would come when they were sick or injured as a result of their work in the chicken plants and when they were unable to access basic medical care and workers' compensation benefits due to their employer's obstructionist tactics. And the worker center could not keep up with the demand for help. It was, there was such great demand. Um, I also, I think it's worth noting that workers in the industry have, have long been highly surveilled, not just by their employers and supervisors, but also by government agencies, right? So in Mississippi, I looked at sort of the role of the state Sovereignty Commission in the 1960s that was there to keep an eye on labor activists, civil rights activists, right? Um, and trying to keep um, people of color and low wage workers from organizing. Um, today, we can look at the sort of federal agencies, right? Like, for example, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, whose periodic workplace raids have functioned largely as a police force that, that ensures undocumented workers, but really all workers, right, keep their heads down and compels them to accept dangerous and dehumanizing con conditions. Um, and the most recent of these, a coordinated raid right before the pandemic um, on seven chicken plants in the towns where I worked is now known as the largest single state workplace raid in U.S. history, um, detaining nearly 700 workers. And I think it it's also important to note that I said like some federal agencies because others like OSHA, right? Occupational Safety and Health Administration, as you all note in your report have been extremely underfunded for the duration of their existence, um, able to do little to oversee the conditions in the industry. So I guess that's sort of what I share to set the scene, right? For when the pandemic fit because hits because the, the factors leading to this industry becoming a hotspot were fundamentally shaped by these sort of political economies of exploitation that are so deeply embedded in this industry's labor practices and, and in low wage work more broadly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's really interesting what you mentioned about OSHA because in these plants, um, the FDA is also present, right? The USDA, sorry. So there's a lot of surveillance of other entities that are really checking on the quality of the meat there's a lot of biocontainment sort of stuff going on to ensure that the meat is, you know, uh, passes all sorts of kind of checks, but this was not applied as we heard in our, in our work to uh, workers, right? It wasn't really applied to the health and safety of workers who um, many of them got infected in, in these plants. Mm -hmm. And I would just uh, add to that, like sometimes food safety comes at the expense of worker yes, safety. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. I want to put, put a pin in the injury discussion because I think we can talk about that with Irene um, when we move to Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question to Angela. What do you, yeah, I mean, I guess 
uh, I guess you spoke a little bit about this, but the failures that led to outbreak, especially in meatpacking, what, how could that story have gone differently? What, what would the alternative story could have, yeah, mm -hmm. instead of the, the failures uh, that were so clear also during the Trump administration, we have to remember that that mm. was the, the moment. I remember being so struck in the early months of the pandemic when my life and so many of our lives were, you know, really transformed dramatically in response to the, the threat of the coronavirus, right? And we were staying home and like nothing was the same in my life. And I would talk to workers um, who I'm still in touch with and their lives were basically the same, right? Heightened levels of stress, but nothing had changed really in their daily um, routines. And, you know, they were sharing that they were pulling, pull, pulling full shifts, that they were still working shoulder to shoulder on lines, um, not a face covering, not even like a plastic shower curtain barrier between them. Um, and, you know, I was following in the news, workers across the country were um, in particular talking about meat and poultry were really making these pleas for paid time off, right? Which would have allowed them to stay home when they had COVID symptoms or suspected exposure. Um, and those weren't gaining traction locally or in DC. Um, I'm also thinking back to when um, a worker leader and friend of mine, Celso Mendoza was dying in the intensive care unit of the University Hospital in Jackson, Mississippi. And he was, you know, on the, on the early end, he got sick in April and passed on May 2nd, um, one of the attending physicians said to his family in the waiting room, this place is full of people from the chicken plants. And it was like, you know, kind of a light bulb going off. So, you know, when the pandemic was raging, workers found themselves, as you guys noted, without sick leave, earning below a living wage, often unable to find another job, um, jobs were scarce, undocumented folks have trouble finding jobs in, in any way, um, and they were largely ineligible for the pandemic-driven unemployment benefits, <clears throat> excuse me, the stimulus ben uh, dividends. Um, they weren't receiving hazard pay. This industry didn't need to offer hazard pay because there were so many other, arguably so many other mechanisms, right, for compelling them to work. Um, so, I mean, what I was hearing resonated with what came out in the report that people, um, you know, couldn't risk staying home, um, felt compelled to show up at work no matter the cost. And you mentioned sort of the the context of the Trump administration in this report in this industry was super important, um, right? Even as as early as April, the industry was already having conversations with the Trump administration, sort of backroom feeling to ensure continuity of production. Um, Tyson Foods put this, famously, infamously put this full, full page ad in several national papers warning of supply shortages and pressured both the CDC and OSHA to relax industry health and safety protections. Um, President Trump then enacted the Defense, uh, Defense Production Act um, to address quote unquote, liability problems in the food supply. And this was sort of essentially signaling to the industry that they could count on the, on the administration to have their backs, right, in case of worker illness and death. So public health departments were trying to shut um, plants down and um, it wasn't, this sort of prevented them from doing it. And um, so I think this is why once the industry later, like maybe starting in May and in the summer of 2020, sort of yielded to some of this public pressure and started offering PPE, temperature checks, plexiglass barriers, like some degree of distancing in break rooms, the workers that I was talking to really saw it as sort of this cruel joke, um, right? Like, who are they kidding? What's the point of taking our temperature? We're, we, we're all, we've already all gotten sick. Um, one person sent me a picture of a t-shirt that said, today I'm a food hero. And sort of, you know, um, I think found it practically laughable. Um, 
I also want to mention some meat processors announced that uh, that summer that they were going to open medical clinics inside of the processing facilities. And this was sort of trumpeted in the news as a positive step forward for workers who might not be able to take time off work, right, in order to get medical care or get tested. Um, and I think others of us who were pretty familiar with this industry's history of surveillance and retaliation against injured and ill workers saw it as a, as a big another red flag of yeah. surveillance. Yeah. And another way of collecting maybe health data haphazardly. Right, right, nice. right. Um, I just wanted to share one more thing with this morning. I checked in with somebody asking like, well, what COVID protections um, and safety measures still exist. There was a report last week indicating that a lot of these have been retired. Um, and their comments really resonated with the report's findings of extensive faulty data collection, like, oh, I went to work last week with 103 degree fever, and they pointed that thing at my head, and this happens all the time. And this person actually, I found it remarkable, they used the word simulacrum to describe the health and safety provisions still in place. And I felt like that was also a real echo with data and society's work, right? The, the sense that there's a performance of care and safety, but not the real thing. So just, you know, I think this kind of surveillance has already always existed. And like you point out, is not for workers' benefits. Thank you. That, that simulacrum word is, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I wanted to turn to Irene uh, speaking about giants. <laughs> um, so Irene, could you share a little bit about your research uh, about workers' experience with COVID in workplaces um, like Amazon warehouses, which we talked to a lot of Amazon uh, workers as Amanda um, previewed and, uh, you know, Amazon, a place that has collects every single, you know, data point in the world. Um, but again, to the benefit of the employers and not, and not for the benefit of the workers who um, were working the whole time and are working still. Thank you, Livia. It's great to be here today uh, discussing this fantastic report. So a lot of my work has focused on Amazon and surveillance, both before the pandemic and um, you know, to the present day, um, and also on workers' experiences with retaliation during COVID. Um, you know, many workers, as Angela has mentioned, faced retaliation for speaking up about their health and safety concerns in the workplace. Um, you know, we starting in March 2020, we started to hear numerous reports of retaliation, uh, not only from, from Amazon workers, um, but you know, across the country, retail workers, um, all kinds of essential workers uh, retaliated against for speaking up about COVID in the workplace. And we conducted a nationwide survey of more than 1,100 workers in mid-May of 2020 and found that more than one in eight workers reported retaliation, um, either against themselves or their coworkers for raising COVID-related workplace concerns. And we also found that black workers were more than twice as likely as white workers to have seen possible retaliation by their employer. Um, and this was also corroborated by on the ground reports by Amazon workers. Um, and so, you know, what we saw is that COVID really laid bare the holes, not only in the health and safety regulations in the US, uh, but the lack of protection against education generally, um, and specifically in an at-will employment context um, in which retaliation is exceedingly hard to prove. So in the United States, an employer can fire you for any reason or for no reason at all. Um, so in that context, you know, the, if the burden is on the worker to, pr to prove that they were retaliated against, it's very, very difficult to prove. The, you know, the employer could have fired you because they didn't like the color of your eyeshadow, not because they were retaliating against you, um, because you spoke up about uh, COVID concerns in, in, your, in your workplace. And so um, sort of out of the experience of COVID, um, there's really been a, a renewed energy to strengthen enforcement and retaliation provisions under you know, health and safety law, um, but also to look at ending the at-will employment system in the US. Um, and we've seen a number of new campaigns started by worker organizations in the last two years to address these issues. Um, in Illinois and in, um, in New York City, there are currently bills to, to establish um, just cause job protections um, and, and to end at-will 
employment. And those really came out of the experience of workers um, during COVID and, and seeing you know, how little protection there was against retaliation. Uh, so I think that's that's one, one important piece. Um, and then I think reading your report, you know, I, I really wanna just lift up how, how this report does such a good job of explaining the flow and control of employee health data and what employers did or did not do with data, you know, specifically about COVID test results um, and how workers created their own systems of, of informal data sharing. Um, but I'd also like to take a moment just to focus our attention specifically on those COVID test results and on the critical period of time before the data about that test result is reported to the employer. Um, so in other words, the moment of data collection and the worker's role there. You know, we tend to, to, to think of surveillance as something that the employer does to the worker in which the worker is as essentially just an object of that surveillance. But I'd like to complicate that slightly um, and share the story of a home care worker from Chicago, uh, Manuela Sepulveda, who is a member of the organization Arise Chicago. Um, and they're part of the uh, campaign for um, the Secure Jobs Act in, in Illinois, um, which would establish just cause job protections um, for all workers in Illinois. So Manuela worked for a home care agency in Chicago. And in April, 2020, she tested positive for COVID, but never experienced any symptoms. After a two week quarantine and a doctor's note, uh, approval from her doctor that she could safely return to her job, Manuela called her employer to return to work. And the employer disregarded her doctor's note and the fact that she had quarantined for two weeks and demanded that she supply a negative COVID test with a very short and arbitrary deadline. At the time, tests were in extremely short supply and most testing sites would not retest someone who had already tested positive and safely quarantined. When she was finally able to secure an appointment for a test, it was one day after the arbitrary deadline that her employer had given her and her employer fired her. So Manuela's experience has been a common one um, and it really illustrates, I think, an important dynamic in, in the COVID health surveillance regime, which is that this is an entire system of health surveillance in which employers coerced workers into collecting and reporting their own health data under the threat of losing their job, penalized them when they were unable to access the resources to do so. And so this, of course, shifted a significant portion of the cost, responsibility, and the labor of health surveillance onto the workers themselves. So the workers were far from sort of passive objects of surveillance, but in some sense, we can sort of understand the system as a form of coerced, worker-subsidized, pay-to-play surveillance. Um, and then as, as your report so brilliantly shows, while employers demanded the health data from workers as a condition of employment, they didn't necessarily use those data to protect workers' health and did sometimes use those data to discipline and control workers. So, you know, I, I think that's a, everything that you're reporting. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. You're, you're breaking up a little bit, but that's really, that's a really interesting uh, perspective, sort of the moment before. I mean, we heard so many uh, from so many workers that even the moment of testing was both uh, was extremely confusing just logistically. Also, uh, we interviewed workers from the entire country. So the experiences of workers in different parts of the, the states were very, very different. They were under very different, you know, mask mandates, uh, vaccine. And we, we heard all kinds of attitudes too, in terms of um, willingness to get tested, willingness to get vaccinated, willingness to wear a mask. But in the confusion was definitely uh, the through line. La confusión fue el punto eh, limitante de esto. Muchos trabajadores no sabían a dónde acudir para hacerse una prueba. Solo sabía que tenían que hacerse la prueba y reportar sus resultados. Y es interesante el contraste entre lo que hablas tú y, y en la industria de las procesadoras de carne. La política es no vacunarse. Hay una ignorancia voluntaria siempre a la conveniencia del empleador. Quiero hacer una pregunta adicional. Estoy acá, sí. 
yes, yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, Creo que si estás ahí. Si hablamos del aspecto relacionado a los datos, siempre hay una tensión. Lo que nos hemos dado en este informe es que hay una tensión entre la privacidad de los datos y la seguridad de los empleados. Hay una oposición falsa, o sea, es decir, cómo navegamos, de qué otra forma podemos considerar o qué temas debemos considerar cuando vemos los datos producidos de los eh, empleados, el eh, tema de los And also the arbitrary and selective use of surveillance data for disciplinary purposes. Um, you know, that section in, in your report where you talk about how cameras were used retroactively and um, often selectively for punitive purposes after the fact. Um, I think, you know, these are the concerns, some of the concerns that workers um, had that, that, that we've also heard about. And these concerns really point to fundamental gaps in our current regulatory system governing surveillance in the work. Um, and it's because our framework on protecting people from surveillance in the United States is largely based on a consumer privacy model. Um, and there's a well-developed -deve body of consumer privacy regulation. So policymakers have tended to default framework. And, you know, a lot of first worker and workplace surveillance reflected that, almost like they just replace the word consumer with the word worker in the legislation. Um, and you know, so these bills deal with questions like, are the workers notified when data is collected? Where will the data be stored? You know, will it be, will the data be shared without permission? Will the data be sold? Um, you know, all of these are important questions, but they don't necessarily get to the heart of what you talk about in your report. Um, and you know, the And it's, it's because the power dynamic and the relationship between workers and their employers is fundamentally different from that between a consumer and a corporation. And so workplace data collection has different implications and the policy really has to address that. Um, so we've been working on developing policy models um, on workplace surveillance, uh, specifically in, in New York City, um, as, as part of um, the, the Secure Jobs Act that was just introduced Uh, about a month ago in New York City. And so I'll just talk a little bit about two important elements um, that, that need to be included in any workplace surveillance uh, policy. Okay. Um, and so the first is access to both individual and aggregate data. So workers need to, and this, 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 you know, this uh, applies not only to health data, but also to, um, you know, for example, at Amazon, work speed data and a data that's collected around quotas that's then used for discipline. So workers need to have access not only to their own individual data, but also to, to aggregate data that's collected in the workplace that affects their job or their health. Um, and so obviously anonymized, but um, you know, this access to the aggregate data is especially important because as your report shows, employers sometimes use surveillance data in arbitrary and selective ways retroactively. And when workers have no access to the aggregate data on the entire workplace, or at least for similar workers in the same establishment, they have no way to prove, for example, that they're being retaliated against. Um, and you know, they have no way to prove that the rules are being consistently applied. So that's number one. And then secondly, um, an important element which is related is establishing legal standards for discipline and termination. Um, and this is this is this is the work that we've been doing on on just cause. Um, so you know, discipline and termination is really where the rubber hits the road for workplace surveillance. This is you know this is this is when workers sort of start to fear for their livelihoods and for their jobs. 
But in this country, we don't have any protections related to discipline or termination for workers. So these new surveillance technologies that we started to see at Amazon and in, in other places, they basically put our system of at-will employment on steroids. So if we want to address the problems related to surveillance that we've been seeing in the workplace, we, we also have to address um, the, the, basic, the basic fundamental lack of protections around discipline and termination um, for workers in this country. So as I, as I mentioned before, this, there's a growing movement for policy reform related to surveillance um, and related to, to um, the at-will employment regime that has really been born in the wake of workers' experience um, in the COVID era. Thank you, Irene. That's that's really fascinating. I mean, I think what's so challenging about, uh, I wanted to ask you both what kind of changes, I mean, you've both talked about it, but what kind of changes we need to see, and it's just, sometimes it's overwhelming because we need to see so many changes at so many different levels. I mean, uh, in many ways, this report is about sort of the, the flow of information and, and health data, but the conversations we had with many workers were about the precarity of uh, US labor. I mean, about how there's fundamental brokenness in the system. I mean, starting with a paid, paid time off, paid sick leave. I mean, so many workers did not have that right. And so they decided to go to work sick, uh, knowingly infecting other people, sometimes even saying, you know, I, I just had to come to work, please stay away from me, I'm infected. Um, and so the you're right, there's so many, I like the expression on steroids because in many ways, Amazon is the on steroidization of everything, right? Uh, of the surveillance, of the precarity, of the sort of um, replaceability of the, of the American worker. Um, so if you want to share, uh, I know we have some questions. We have one question. I, uh please 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 uh feel free to put other questions in the chat either for amanda and me or for our speakers um but yeah angela and irene if you could just you know if we can end with what what can we do uh what are the gaps and regulations that we need to see both on a policy level and um, to improve labor conditions for um for these workers who are not essential anymore right there was the heroic phase and that was you spoke to that Angela sort of the the contradiction and absurdity of being essential and yet dispensable at once. Angela, if you want to start, that'd be great. Okay. Um, I mean, I think you, your report highlights it so beautifully, right? We need to listen to workers and what they're saying, and you know, in sort of thinking about the COVID moment, this was primarily we need sick leave, right? We need to be able to stay home and not not risk our jobs and and not risk our livelihoods um and i just think that you know voice that the voice of workers is so important in guiding the development of policy and really needs to be included in the populations at the table as we imagine and plan for future pandemic responses um they need access to the basic protections of workers comp and as the report found to mental health resources right in their native languages, sort of given the immense stress of, of working through a pandemic. They need OSHA to be more fully resourced and empowered to protect workers. And then, I mean, to Irene's point, they need protection against reporting, uh, you know, reporting illness and injury. Um, they need protection um, for workplace organizing, right? Um, protection against retaliation in these cases. It shouldn't, it shouldn't have to be the, you know, hashtag children of Smithfield who were, did amazing work um, advocating for their parents. Um, workers should be able to share information, health information and other, right? And organize without fear of losing their jobs or in the case of a lot of immigrant workers being detained and deported. Um, I think the report also lifts up the important role that unions played in the in the helpful circulation of health data, and this should be the rule, right? Not the exception. Um, I guess in sort of scoping out just a little bit more, and then I'll hand it over to Irene. I, I think that the food chain industry in, in particular determined 
decades ago that mass production and vertical integration and, and the exploitation of undocumented labor are really the keys to corporate profit. And this business model has been taken up by many other low wage industries. And I think it's also facilitated by us, right, as a society that devalues and criminalizes and exploits the most vulnerable among us. And the pandemic just made this more visible. So I think when, when I think about what needs to change, I think about the ways in which we need to think about a different ethic, right? When that that puts values people over profit. Your report talks about this in terms of respect. Um, but I, I remember during the pandemic sort of coming to this understanding of that the, the root problem is really that corporations are accountable solely to their investors, right? And shareholders, and this puts so much pressure on corporations um, and surveillance disciplines workers to make sure that as much labor is, ex is extracted in the lower, lowest at the lowest possible cost. So could we imagine, I think even in previous moments, this wasn't the case, right? Could we imagine a different ethic in which corporations were not only account held accountable to, to shareholders, but also to the communities where they work and to the workers. Um, and I think the pandemic was a moment to sort of do that reimagining. And this report is another crucial intervention to allow us to reflect on, on who our system is benefiting and what might be possible. So Thank I you. hope we don't let that, that's, that that's moment really slip kind away. Of yeah, no, I like I like the reimagining um, because that is a bold reimagination. Thinking about rebalancing corporate power, especially in this country, and um, and talking about Amazon, also the carceral. We didn't talk about this, but sort of the carceral uh, feel that both um, sort of Amazon and some of the meatpacking places um, share. Sort of even in sort of their apparatus, right? There's a history there that that's for a whole other conversation. Um, Irene, to you if you want. I think Angela pretty much <laughs> covered covered it, um, but I think the the say it again, Irene. Say it again. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think the one thing that I I would also highlight, um, sort of on more of a, a a micro level on the in terms of the warehouse workers, um, are these warehouse worker protection acts that you know the so AB seven hundred one was passed in California um, about about a year ago, um, and what it is is uh, transparency um, for quotas for warehouse workers so that places, employers like Amazon that are constantly changing what the expectations and the quotas are, um, you know, by alg algorithm are at least required to disclose that to, to the workers. Um, and, you know, as part of the, this, this was passed in, in California and, and also in New York State, um, last year and in New York State what we were able to get also is is giving workers access to not only their own individual data but also the aggregate data which as I would mentioned before you know I think is is just critical to how we sort of approach um, any kind of policy towards surveillance and um, worker data uh, in the workplace moving forward so I think I would just encourage you know I think the these those bills are are just a a start um, there, you know, there, but I think we, you know, we, it's a, it's a toehold into these questions um, that Amazon has opened for, for, um, for all of us about, you know, what is the future of work um, and, and, you know, what and how, how we can respond to that as a movement. Um, so I, I would just point to that. And then I don't want to sound like um, a broken record, but of course also um, establishing just cause job protections and ending at will employment, I think is foundational to, um, you know, any vision of um, a, you know, fair workplace and um, economic, racial, social justice in this country. So, yeah, so I'll pass it back to you, Livia. Thank you. Bold, bold imaginings. I like, I like that. I love um, so we're about to close, but I wanted to address some of the questions that are in the Q&A before uh, we wrap up. Um, there's a question here that's interesting about the report authors, uh, which I guess is me in this moment, talking about how public health surveillance plays a protective role, or if there were any cases of COVID surveillance used responsibly. Um, we have in our, in our studies, some people who worked for uh, manufacturing companies that were um, 
highly where were highly specialized workers worked and where in sort of in these in these companies there was already an attitude um, towards health and safety because hazards were present in the in these workplaces so the uh, sort of the the transition between that and having um, an ethos of health and safety around covid was uh, was easier than in other industries we had uh, a couple of workers who used some interesting contact um, tracing devices um, that was there were little sort of pins that um, didn't collect really any uh, extensive amount of data, but just let people know when they were close to each other uh, and would inform um, through a manager if someone had had a, um, a contact. But this system worked also because there was a lot of trust between the employers and the um, between the managers, the employers and the workers, um, because we can see how that could be definitely uh, mismanaged. We in general, there were a lot of employers who really tried to do the right thing and we didn't get to a lot of the confusion around health information and the ADA and many of the workers cited HIPAA as the reason why um, they weren't comfortable sharing their own information also about vaccination or why employers couldn't share sick. HIPAA actually has nothing to do with this. HIPAA has been sort of invoked so much during the pandemic and it's actually not that relevant outside of clinical settings. Um, so that created a lot of confusion, even for workers, even for employers who were really trying their best to protect their own, their own workers. So um, there's some other questions. Um, the other group, uh, just before I go to the closing, the other group that we spoke to were grocery uh, store workers, which we didn't really talk about. Uh, and grocery store workers uh, and sort of retail workers in big box stores who were open during the beginning of the pandemic had a very different um, environment because they were in contact with the public. So they were also in an environment where they couldn't control uh, who was coming in and out of their stores with different kinds of man, uh, mask mandates, very different attitudes about um, sort of customers wanting to wear a mask, not wanting to wear a mask in certain states. Uh, and so that those environments were kind of uh, different because they had contact with people who were not part of the workplace. And so trying to maintain distance was something that was very, very stressful to them. Um, I think we are going to uh, wrap up. Thank you uh, so much for your questions and please feel free to email Amanda and I uh, if you have any questions about the report. Um, so first, I would just really want to thank Angela Stacey and Irene Tung for being here and for all the work that you've done and shared with us uh, and for really graciously reading our report and uplifting it. Uh, thank you uh, so much for that. Uh, thank you for uh, interpretation to Valeria Lara and Claudia Alvarez um, in uh, Lima and Mexico City. Uh, thank you, Rigo and Tunica, for making this event possible and smoothly. Um, and thank you to our other co authors on this report, uh, Uretia Kinrenade and Joan Mukagosi, for all their hard work. We worked two years on this project, so uh, a shout out definitely goes to them. And our gratitude really goes to uh, the essential workers who spoke to us and shared their experiences. Um, it was very strange in some in instances to have the privilege to work virtually um, and hear these experiences while um, these workers did not have that privilege. So we are very grateful. So you can take a look at the advanced embargo copy of the report in the chat. Uh, so the full release will happen next Wednesday, March 1st, after which please feel free to share this far and wide. Um, and you can reach out with any questions or comments. And uh, I think that is a wrap. So thank you all for attending and take care. <laughs>